Hey everybody, Dave McEwen here and welcome to another episode of Lead Like You Give a Damn where I speak with leaders and leadership experts on where do we go from here. Delighted that you've joined me today. We are going live across LinkedIn, Facebook and YouTube. We go live every Friday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, and then we also go out across iTunes, Spotify and all of those great platforms on Monday afternoon. So whether you're tuning in live or you're listening to the uh, podcast on Spotify or iTunes, thank you so much for deciding to spend the next 30 minutes with me and my fantastic guest this week. Um, my guest is Shannon uh, Minifi. Minifi? Minifi? You got it. Yeah. Uh, she is the CEO of Box of Crayons. You may remember we had the founder of Box of Crayons on at the beginning of the season and I am going to round out the Box of Crayons experience by having Shannon on today. Shannon, thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? Thank you, Dave. I'm doing quite well. It's getting warmer tomorrow and so I'm I'm feeling happy about that. Excellent. You are up in Toronto, am I right? I'm up in Toronto, and it's been uh, it's been a cruel April for a number of reasons, obviously. But yeah, it's been cold. I think it feel every year it feels more seasonally cold than it was the year before. But it's getting warm this weekend, so it's those little things right now. Excellent. A little bit of sunshine will certainly help in the current um, environment that we're in. The first question that I always start out with for all my guests is, what are you best known for? What am I best known? No, known to whom, Dave? <laughs> to anybody, to the world, to your family, to your next door neighbor, to yourself? Yeah. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm probably most known for making literary references in unexpected contexts. <laughs> <laughs> Dropping David Foster Wallace. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm hardly known for it. But like you said, I'm the CEO of Box of Crayons. Um, so we're a learning and development company that helps organizations unleash the power of curiosity to create connected and engaged company cultures. So that's that. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you've been with the company for some time now, a few years, um, but you've you've essentially skyrocketed through the organization. Tell me about just your leadership journey. You know, where did you start and then how did you get to this position that you're in? Sure. Yeah. Skyrocket is is one way of describing it. Another another way of describing it is having a, a five year old career. That's another, that's another way to describe that quick ascent. Um, so yeah, you're right. So I basically come, I've been at Box of Crayons for coming up on five years. So December will be five years. Right. Um, and I basically come straight into Box of Crayons and into the learning and development space right out of university. Um, but I only graduated in November of this past year in 2019. Right. Um, so I'll explain that. So <laughs> I've been because you're like, wait a minute. So I've been in graduate school since 2008, uh, starting with my master's in which I did in the States. Uh, and then I did my doctorate at Queen's University here in Canada. And so wow. I just wrapped up my doctoral defense in August. That was on the go for quite some time. Uh, and so graduated in November. So I've really just come out of university here. So you're your so box of crayons was your side hustle essentially and you ended up becoming the C or your academic work was your side hustle i mean or yeah, like it, it changed position so initially box of crayons was my side hustle so i met um our founders uh michael and marcella bungay stanier in 2015 when i was working on my uh dissertation i was abd um and initially box of crayons was the kind of the side hustle so i came th at this through doing book publicity so michael's book the coaching habit was coming out in early 2016 and i knew something about book publishing because i'd worked a couple of contract gigs um as a yet another side hustle to the doctoral program uh, at a small literary press here in uh toronto called coach house books so i met them whilst working another side hustle which was working at a wine bar one day a week so would come in and we would hang out and we would talk about so like they're eggheads too right so michael has an m phil from oxford and his wife did a doctor at oxford too so we talk about books and we talk about the courses i was teaching adjunct at the university and all that kind of stuff so when the book was coming out they were like hey you could replace this side hustle at the restaurant with this other side hustle working for us for a bit doing book publicity and so i came on board in that capacity and at that time we were um, uh, we didn't have employees, so everyone was a contractor at Box of Crayons. And that was the, in some ways, so I've been there for five years, and those were, that was kind of the beginning of 
a really, really transformative time for Box of Crowns. So basically what you're saying is all of the success that Box of Crowns has had over the last five years is down to the fact that you decided to start working for them five years ago. They're just, I mean, is it correlation or is it causation? <laughs> no, no, no so so the, the, the two factors are um, the, the Coaching Habit book, which drove a lot of interest and visibility for the work that we do. Um, the, cre the publicity of the book, which was not just... Uh, my efforts by any means. Um, the creation of a proper sales process and sales team outside of Michael, who was sort of selling himself at that time. Um, and then also an operations team to deliver against the demand that we suddenly had. So yes, it's the popularity of the book and it's the structures that at that time Box of Michael started to build in Box of Crayons to support that demand. Um, yeah, so I moved into sales from there, from the book publicity piece. Um, that, that's awesome. So there are a couple of bit, there's a couple of really clearly key segments of your journey and your life there that I think would be really helpful to kind of dig into a little bit. First of all, then, is essentially, at what point did you say, hey, you know what, this learning development sphere, this company, what we're doing, like, this is this is what I want to do. Like, what what was the shift for you there? Yeah. So when I was wanting to be an academic, the reason that I stayed on, so after you write a master's thesis, which is like 100 pages, but still really hard. Um, most people finish and they're like, yeah, I don't ever want to do that again. And that's why it's a useful exercise. Then you go and get a job. And instead, I was like, no, I think I want to do that again, because I'm not uh, I not because I wasn't ready to leave, but because I wanted to find a way to be a part of conversations that I thought were important. Mm -hmm. I felt, that felt like a way to do that with students and with colleagues. And how did I enter into the discourse of the subject I cared about? Um, and so when I initially started working at Box of Crayons, it was fascinating. Um, and I had no stake in the learning and development world for obvious reasons, because I was right. new to that. Um, and what I was doing, I mean, I'll, I'll get to what, how I came to really love the work that I'm doing and why I think it's important. But one of the other things that I guess I'm known for to the people that I work with is the ability to learn quickly. Right. Um, and which like a lot of people have. And I think for me, it's recognizing that entrance into any world hinges on your ability to speak the language. So to, to master the, the language game, and this is true of any world really, right? So your vocabulary kind of demarcates the limit of what you can understand and what you can articulate and maybe the limits of knowledge, but that's a debate for another show and day. Sure. But anyway, so I'm pretty attuned to language. So part of having to figure out what's the corporate world about, because I've worked right. What's learning and development about? What do our buyers care about? Meant figuring out the language people use and the lingo people use and mastering that pretty quickly. Um, as I started to grow up in this space, what became apparent to me is really being at stake is our ability as a company to help people have a better work life. Mm. So what Box of Crayons has done, um, what the founders of Box of Crayons have done is set up an organization that cares about um, maximizing what like a, a human experience in a, in a corporate context. Mm -hmm. and, that's, mm -hmm. and that's important. Yeah, I think that's huge. And, and, and to, to your point there, I think one of the key things that successful leaders are able to do, you, you talked about learning the language of it. It's, 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 it's learning how to learn. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, I can be good at, at cooking a particular dish or I can learn how to play the guitar. Or I can learn how to code. And, and quite often people say, well, you know, I know how to do that one thing. And it's like, well, hold on. If you, if you, if you just take the process that you went through to get good at that thing, you, you surely it'll be different in the, di in a different functional perspective somewhere else, but there are constructs that you can adapt from one place to the other and, and give you that sort of adaptability, I guess. Right. Yeah, for sure. And it, part of it is also understanding who influences the way that people think. So trying to understand the, the folks I'm in conversation with, how do they navigate the, their world? Right. Like what, what are the um, thought leaders of that? What is the, the history of thought that's informed how they think about what they think about and what they care about? Right. Oh, organizational design. So I came from a world where I had a whole other set of Kind of thinkers and history of thought and so it was kind of learning that it's like what what are the constellate what's the constellations that make up this universe for people in this space um and so so never about kind of trying to memorize but trying to understand all of the things that inform that knowledge base 
um, and then having to start there myself, right? I did what I always do, which is I go and I do the reading. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, and and I love that actually because then that's your that's your first that's that's how you return to first principles, right? I'm yeah. guessing. So if you're put into any new circumstance, you go back to the thing that you know to be true about you and what you can do and your skill set, and then you build up from from there. Right. Yeah. And I think I just always recognize that people, everything exists in a discourse. So who else are, who are people in conversation with right. informally and who's in that space and what's your thing? And, uh, and it's just, it's how I sort things in my mind. And so Got I it. That with the same kind of approach. I, I, I love that. I think it's, it's hugely helpful for folks out there who are being forced to deal with an ever changing situation right now. Like, you know, we, we can learn and, and grow and develop in that. Before I come on to just the specifics of where we're at right now, I'd love to hear just a little bit about that initial transition into the CEO role kind of before um, uh, our wonderful yeah. global pandemic. What, what was the biggest challenge for you in all of that? And, and how did you how did you overcome that and rise to the occasion and all of that good stuff? Yeah. So um, we had been working on my transition. So I took over the role uh, on July 1st of 2019. And we had been working on that transition formally for at least six months and sort of informally for at least 12 to 18 months prior mm. to July 1st. Um, so we, I think Michael mentioned this as well because you had um, my boss on on a few episodes ago. Um, and he talked about, we work with and continue to work with a transition coach who's been excellent, who recognizes the high instance of failure um, for a first time CEO taking over for a founder and how difficult it can be um, for founders, like understandably to let go, mm -hmm. to see things happening uh, to their company, to their baby. Um, that, and they've, they've, uh, they've relinquished that control willingly. Now they have to stand by and watch right. and for the company to be successful. They need to stand by and watch. And um, so the woman we worked with Jill was fantastic. And she helped me see where the bulk of the work was going to lie. She and, and my coach that I work with helped me see where the bulk of the work was going to lie. So it was kind of around two things. One is around understanding um, what compels uh, Michael to want to take his hands off of things and, and step back from that role. One of those things being that, you know, first of all, to found a company that can grow beyond the size of the founder mm. is a, is a cr insane accomplishment. Yeah. And so recognizing the sort of limits of what, um, of what a single person can do is, uh, an amazing thing for him to recognize and have people around him to help him recognize because the way that Jill framed it was in order for, you know, only an organization can fulfill an organizational mission. Mm. A single person cannot do that. So for me, it underlies, it underlines this commitment to the longevity of the mission of the organization. Right. But then it's founder. That's not you that you say that, but it's, that's hard for people to actually embrace, I think. I think that uh, was, I, would have trouble embracing that. So I think it's it's yeah. massively hard for people to embrace. And funny enough, I mean, it, it's ac particularly acute at the founder level, but actually I think it happens at, at any leadership level. There's, you know, there's this notion, particularly mm -hmm. if you've been in an organization for any length of time, you've built your legacy, you've built your fiefdoms, you've built your team. There's probably a sense of over-reliance on you. There's probably a sense of, um, you know, this is my mini business that I'm running. And, and, and but the problem is you can't scale yourself. You can't scale the impact of your team if it's dependent on you saving the day, on you being the hero, on you knowing the answers and and, and all of that stuff. And I know that's something that you at Box of Crowns really work on, this notion of curiosity. Um, how does that play? How is that played in general? And then how is that played for your own particular transition? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a good question. So first, let me think to, to the first part of the question of, of pulling out of uh, like decreasing those dependencies. That was totally the the name of the game in, in the first half of the year. Um, so it, it was like anywhere I look, if I see that Michael's tethered to something, how do I untether that thing? Right. That it actually frees him up and so that it frees up the organization to continue doing what it needs to do. And right. then also, and crucially to your other point about this isn't just a founder thing, not re-entrenching or like re-tying new tethers to me. How? So, so how do I, do I also not create a dependency? How do I not re replace myself as the dependent factor? And so finding the places where I can participate in um, program development and what that looks like and some of the thought leadership what that looks like, but because it's enjoyable and I can contribute to it, but I'm not creating a dependency by doing that. So that's been a really crucial thing because for me, success at the end of the year will be that I can look back and the organization can run 
can run itself, not because right. what I do is obsolete and I don't need to be doing it. I, I get the role that I play, but that I don't, there's nothing I need to be in the doing of. Yeah. Um, and, and that's that's so true. Like the scalability of any team or organization comes down to the removal of the heads in the role and a, and a discussion around that the hats. So rather than being dependent on Michael or Shannon or or uh, Marlene or anybody else in the organization, you're dependent on a CEO. You're dependent on a VP of sales. You're dependent on a marketing director. The role becomes the thing that you hook the dependency into, and and the body is just somebody that that inhabits or fills that role for a period of of time. Sounds like you went through a process kind of like that. Yeah, yeah, like distributing the capability and building and building out those capabilities everywhere else has been what we've been working really hard on doing. And I'm really proud of the team because we're doing really well. That, that's great. So I interrupted you midflow. We were talking about curiosity then yeah. as well. So, yeah. so in general, and then how specific for you? Yeah. So in general, for me, one of the most interesting um, and useful things about curiosity is its propensity to foster, you know, in particular, intellectual humility. So I know, you know, we've been talking about co uh, being curious as sort of the poster behavior of, of coaching. Um, and uh, the Advice Trap book, which a founder just put out recently, talks about humility as well as, like, as a crucial part of, of leadership. And for me, intellectual humility is the thing. So the most important kind of intellectual capacities that we've had as humans have been knowledge and reason, right? And I'd like to argue that our ability to be curious is something worth developing considerably more. So this isn't an argument for anti-intellectualism. It's not an argue against, argument against science or against reason, but it's an argument about recognizing our own intellectual fallibility and for recognizing our biases against those who are other and ideas that don't lend themselves easily to our own positions or our understanding of things. Um, so this idea that curiosity can help you to really interrogate your own assumptions mm is is really is really interesting to me so the it's, way that it's, it's huge i mean just just pause yeah. on that i mean how i mean and i fall far of this all the time where you know i'll, I'll be engaging in any discussion and, and then I, I step back and ask myself do i really believe that when was the last time i actually tried to challenge the assumptions that i've had totally. and, and 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 i think it, it it lends itself to a whole range of, of things it better discourse better discussions better stronger relationships less de less dependency on people um i mean it's just huge yeah, I mean, like you you just said it another way, the primacy of our own subjectivity really too quickly helps us inform our interpretation of our perspective as the perspective. And we stop interrogating that. And there's um, there's research to show that when we are encountering opinions that are in support of ours, mm. or when we're encountering a, a breadth of opinions, we have the reasoning sorting capability to go to the ones that support our opinion and sort of ignore the ones that don't. Right. Um, but we have the tendency to stop investigating primary sources and just accepting also secondhand opinions when they come from perspectives that we see as aligned to our own as well. And so we see as, as by default true. Um, and it's even more compelling for us to do this because of the way in which we've conflated the things we take positions on and our sort of cultural or social identities. Right. And I hardly need to point to the polarized state of contemporary politics to illustrate it. But right. you, it's people just go there immediately. But it also happens in our workplaces, right? It's not just about political, social, moral, ethical discourse. It's about not challenging your assumptions as a leader and what has come before, and just and and, and not allowing that room for curiosity. So, what else do you yeah. see? Does Box of Crayon see as kind of the the? I guess first of all, the negative impact of of not being curious, and then what it unlocks for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let so think. Let's think about then the ramifications of of this of uh, curiosity as a intellectual capacity that is not seeking to serve the the person, not sort of mm. re entrench their own opinion. It's not seeking to sort of harness knowledge in order to master, which is not always, but often the reason that people seek knowledge, right? And it's not just like this platitude of knowledge is power, but actually people seek to know things in order to have a position of power often, right? right. So curiosity lacks this sort of colonizing impulse and is actually characterized by like wonder and awe and like a true, I'm truly curious about what that other opinion is mm. because, of the, because of the vista it might open up for me, right? So think about that in terms of organizational and business success. So if it's the case and it is the case that low curiosity individuals 
are given a choice and choose to opt for familiar evidence that's consistent mm. with what they already believe, then the implications for how leaders and really anyone at any level of the organization are making decisions about what's true, what's important, what's the real challenge, how to best solve those challenges, it's not difficult to see why low curiosity becomes a problem, right? right. People start going down the wrong path. Um, and then on the other hand, high curiosity individuals actually prefer to explore what is more novel. Um, mm. Is actually even opposed to their initial position. So they're able, I think, to do two things. They're able both to sit in a place of curiosity. So like not rush in and, and just give advice and, and show that they know the answer. But they're also capable of a sort of self-regulating capacity that recognizes their own intellectual fallibility and will sit there long enough to interrogate their own assumptions. Right. Two of those things, like a practical ability of biting your tongue, and it's recognizing the thing that that makes you want to uh, affirm your own position in the first place. And, and so that's the interesting thing, right? Because there's a difference between the behavioral aspect of this, which let's face it, anybody can fake thing, get good at, you know, build totally. and, you know, just, mm -hmm, yeah. yeah, sure, tell me more. What else? What else? What else? There's a difference yeah. between that. And then there was a definition that you gave that I'll not repeat because I can't remember the the wonderful eloquent way in which you put it about true curiosity being in service to something other than yourself or being in service right. to something other than your own positions and perspectives that's a mindset shift that's a perspective sh shift and that's a really difficult thing to to do right i mean yeah. how, how do you how do you go from just making a behavioral shift i can ask the right questions i can you know yeah. not rush to action to actually becoming a truly curious person yeah, it's it's also a, a vulnerable position to put yourself in. Like it's exposed, right. um, and in the, it's a really multidisciplinary field. And in some of the sort of like behavioral folks who've measured it and actually looked at also animals doing what they call like curiosity or wonder um, responses in the wild are like actually truly their their defenses come down and they are physically more vulnerable to the things around them and for the moment that they're in a wonder or an awe state. Wow, which is, so you can see why no one and leaders don't wanna put themselves there mm. <laughs> um, because it feels too, it's exposing. Um, yeah, so how do you how do you both do the behavior thing and then how do you do the mindset shift? I think, so what are, what are, what we're trying to do is have, so the, for the folks that go through our programs who are, you know, people leaders, who are individual contributors, we're trying to have them see what that kind of behavior serves in in themselves so why why do i want to jump in and not mm. just because you want it sometimes it's like i just want to quickly get going because i think i know the answer but have them sort of look at what is dark about themselves that they might not want to face which is right. like this makes me feel safe this makes me feel smart this makes me look capable um and have them so i think having them recognize that thing not in order that they can quickly then change it because it's not just like some cognitive behavioral therapy approach that's going to work for the long term but have them start to get <laughs> this is a meta layer on top <laughs> but have them get curious about why they do those things so part right. of the, in the slowing down that rush to action is that self-reflective moment of why do i want to do that in order mm. that longer term, they, they can start to see that that behavior doesn't serve them. Because if it's just a simple one to switch, to your point, it's not going to, the mindset shift isn't going to be there if they're not right. curious about it themselves for long enough. Um, and I think organizations need to support that too, right? So um, Francesca Gino, you know, brought together a whole bunch of research in like a, a or like a edition of HBR that's about a year old about the business case for curiosity. So she brought together a bunch of other folks research and sort of went through that herself and talked about the change needing to happen at two levels. There's like an organizational tweaks to the organization, the way the organization supports and fosters curiosity. Mm. And, and one of the ways is in how they manage people. So we're really looking at, you know, not just formal people leaders and managers, but how people interact with each other as more curious beings. And, um, like asking that people be curious and creating that space for curiosity. But in terms of a whole organizational shift, like the complex change of, of all of the shifts in mindset and values and behaviors um, requires that an organization truly show that it values that, or it's wow. just not going to be sustaining. And that's a piece we cannot do. It's the partnership we want. Right. Yeah. I mean, because at the end of the day, there's your, you've got a, 
a seesaw or a rope or something that's being pulled on one hand is just like the transactional stuff that we have to get through every single day to hit our numbers, to hit our metrics, to serve our customers, all of that. And then on the other hand, there's like, well, what, what are you actually building here uh, in terms of the legacy of your organization? And more importantly, the legacy of the people that are coming through this organization. Yeah. And I think it's super simple to pay lip service to that and say, yeah, we do value our people. I mean, every organization says that we value our people, but do you value them enough to say, you know what, let's just slow down just enough so that we can be a little more curious so that we can be a little bit more intentional. People are so scared of that because they feel like, well, we're just not going to get anything done and we're just all going to sit around and we'll never get out there and it'll be like a, a big discussion group yeah. that'll never never get us out of there. How do you, how do you balance those two yeah. things? Yeah, I mean, it's it, the point you're calling out is true, right? So many organizations, at least nominally, want to foster and encourage curiosity, but then either the people in the organizations are like, yeah, we stay at the curious place, but I don't actually feel like I have um, the ability to speak up. Right. Um, interesting that like the senior leaders who like chew a lot of scenery get to feel like they they, they get to share, um, share their ideas. And then a whole lot of, you know, it depends where you sit, whether or not you think that they're, um, is a di diversity of, of voice share and whether or not curiosity is really fostered in the organization. And then other senior leaders also say what you were just saying, which is they, they kind of secretly fear that like an entirely democratic process isn't going to get anything done and like there needs to be some decisiveness. So yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult balance. I think how do you create, how do you give enough overall direction, but then create enough autonomy mm -hmm. um, at the level at which that responsibility and autonomy exists right so people can they know what the work is to be done but how they're going to do that work and the questions they're going to ask as part of their investigation and doing it the right way is like demarcates their their space of their own curiosity and investigation yeah and i think that's huge and one of the things that i often feel i mean i'm biased because i am a facilitator but i actually think one of the, the the greatest leadership skills that a leader can develop is how to facilitate a group process because so, so then you then you're not worried about the democratic nature of things slowing things down. You can actually hold the space so that people can be curious and know and be confident in 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 the process that you're working through. That in 30 minutes you can get through as many um, decisions as you would have, and probably more than you would have if you did the non curiosity route. And I think that if you combine the curiosity with good facilitation, then your world is your is your is your lobster, as my grandmother used to say. Um, <laughs> And, and I just don't, you know, I don't see a lot of that because there's just this, it is, it's that scaredness of, well, if I give everybody a voice, we'll never get out of this room. Well, I've got news for you. Do you know what you normally do? You sit in a room for 60 minutes and the loudest people, they have their voice and nobody else says anything anyway. So you totally. may as well open it up. Totally. In some ways, I'd love for that to be the fear that if I open this up, it'll just, we won't get anywhere because it'll be too democratic. I think the actual fear is if I open this up, I won't be seen to know, I won't be seen as the expert and we'll yeah. know the answer. And I think that's usually where the cookie crumb goes. And, and my, my goodness, if there was one thing that I just would love to impart and instill upon leaders who listen to this, that is okay. In fact, your strength comes in not knowing the answer. You don't need to be the expert in everything. You know, find a way to let your ego let go of that and know that your job is to get the best out of your people, not to know the answer. Right. And in fact, like back to the intellectual, the importance of intellectual humility, it's actually dangerous to put so much in um, stake in your own, in your own subjectivity and in your own opinion. Absolutely. We're coming to a close here. And so I've just got one final question uh, for you, which is where do you see curiosity playing the role in how we emerge from what we're going through? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I think that um, one of the things, you know, everyone's reading the sort of the, the top six things that will be different when we go back to a new, what the new normal will look like. Mm. And one of the really big things is that, and that I'm seeing, is that organizations who are used to not collecting ideas and collecting opinions and encouraging that curiosity are going to come out with, with fewer ideas about how to reimagine themselves. Right. So the ability to source ideas from your entire organization is, is going to be really important as organizations are having to be nimble and sometimes rethink their entire business model. Yeah. 
I think that's huge. Well, thank you, Shannon, for being here. That was um, a wonderful discussion. I could talk to you all day about this. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add into the mix to make this a complete experience for you? No, I mean, this was it was fun. This was awesome. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for joining me, Shannon. For anybody that is interested in learning more about what Box Crayons do, they can go to boxcrayons.com um, and check out um, their programs and their books. They really are one of the gold standards out there in learning development at the minute. They do an awesome job. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Shannon, for coming on. Really appreciate it. And uh, I will see you all next week for another episode of Lead Like You Give a Damn. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs>